gets us into this notion of infinite regress. The scientists can give us more and more rigorous explanations. Or descriptions. Or descriptions. Well, go ahead. Tell me yeah. what's going well, on. Well, this is the connection. I mean, Newton is accused by Leibniz of bringing the occult into science because he has this wonderful inverse square law that the force of gravity is proportional to the masses, the two, the two masses exerting the force on each other, divided by the distance squared. But the distance squared term is the, is, is the rub, because it implies that a force is being transmitted through empty space without a mediating material interaction between, for example, the moon and the water that forms of the tides on Earth. So that it's this, the, what comes out of Newton's theory is this mysterious notion of action at a distance, that the force is being transmitted, again, through empty space with no pushing and pulling. Now, at this peri in this period of scientific history, late 17th century, the scientists had rejected what were called Aristotelian formal causes, or um, the, the, there's a, the, the, where the scholastics, late medieval scholastics, often reasoned like this. If I smoke some opium and then it puts me to sleep, then I ask the question, well, why did that happen? Well, it's because the opium had a dormitive virtue. You attribute causal powers to the name of the effect. Right. And this was this, and so the, the mechanical philosophers. But that's out. That's as in the late 17th century, figures like Boyle and others say, we, we got to get rid of that type of explanation. It, it, it's just a, playing a word game. Tragic and, loss. <laughs> agreed. And, <laughs> and so, so Newton comes along and formulates this beautifully comprehensive theory with this highly accurate mathematical descriptions of the motions of the planets, but it doesn't have a pushing and pulling element to it. There's, I can understand why the table moves because I just shoved it, but there's nothing like that. The theory before him was something called the, vortice, uh, the uh, vortices, the idea that there was this mysterious but physical substance called ether pushing the planets around in the way that uh, sticks in a vortex would, would swirl. So sort of make up a substance yeah. if you can't see it. Right, but exactly. Leibniz's objection to Newton is what? Well, he says, look, what causes gravity? What, what is gravity? Well, it's the tendency for unsupported bodies to fall. But, what, what, but why do they fall? Well, because of gravitational force. So what is gravity? It's the tendency for things to fall. Why do they fall? Because of gravitational force. So Leibniz he, says this is he circular. Thinks you're this doing nothing no... more than the scholastics did. You're just renaming the effect as its own cause. And... But that, that was just a mistake because Newton offered a incredible insight with his with the mathematical math formulation. Exactly. He had something the scholastics didn't have, which was the powerful mathematical description. But it raised this deep question then, what is the cause of gravity? The other, the other, the, the other dilemma, the other part of the dilemma that Leibniz was confronting Newton with was in a series of letters that passed between one of Newton's associates and Leibniz was, well, if you don't think it's, if it's not just an empty scholastic word game, then maybe you're talking about an immaterial entity. Maybe you're bringing God into science in a way we're trying to get rid of him.